Oh, welcome, Hi, welcome hello. everyone to Monday Night Gardening Club. No, he's upside down. Who is? No, no we're, we're upside down. <laughs> the new is upside down. <laughs> hey, everyone, so tonight's agenda, sort of like usual, Q&A. You know, we didn't ask anybody if they would do the weekly update, but I hope Bill and Gary will do that for us. Yeah, maybe we should mute everyone. Everyone, if you can mute while we're doing this. Thank you. Yeah. And um, we'll have a couple announcements and a presentation on trellises by Brendan this evening. Okay. <clears throat> um, here's the first question. The first rule of pruning, if you don't know what you're doing, stop. Can anyone suggest a person to hire for doing some pruning? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, could everyone? Uh, could you mute everyone, Michael, and then we'll just uh, unmute for. Uh... Yeah. Thanks. Alex is here. Pruning what? Oh, like pruning plants and shrubs. Shrubs mainly. It's it's, it's shrubs and stuff. This is this is my question. It will it may may possibly save my marriage. So if somebody can come up with a good <laughs> answer here, it would be greatly appreciated. Uh, Raphael knows a lot about pruning, but he has a full time job now. Right. So. And I asked him, and he he sort of he said I could. I yeah. I asked him first. So what you you have very high shrubs, and you and you want to prune them, or uh, what is the uh, um, there's a couple like um, just outside our porch that have this really fragrant blossom in the springs. And when we first moved in, they probably, you know, the, the real estate, because they probably the real estate agent hired someone to make them sort of cut in box and look perfectly shaped. And I just can't keep them under control. And there's another along, um, um, I can sort of hack back the uh, um, forsythia head, but there's another forsythia ball that's growing in our yard that really last time I did it, you know, the difference between a good haircut and a bad haircut is two weeks, but it was not two weeks for this guy to <laughs> recover from my job on that. So, okay. Mm. I think I know somebody. I'll get you some information. I'll send it over to you. Okay, thanks, Nicole. No problem. Yes, in, in this coronavirus, we've seen a lot of bad haircuts. So we, uh, we don't want to see our shrubs the same way. Are those pictures clear? Yes. But small. What are these in my pine trees? Oh. You know, we muted everyone, but you can take your mute off. You want to unmute yourself, Christina? I'm not muted. Jack, do you know what those are? No idea. I would guess that there's some sort of insect gall. Oh, really? So that's like a, what, an insect uh, nest or something on the pine tree? Yeah, you see it a lot on oaks um, and almost every plant has a, an insect that will lay its eggs into the plant uh, along with it's co-evolved to inject its eggs along with hormones that make the plant kind of grow a little bit strange it's really common on um goldenrod you see big bulbs on them and it provides a space for the larvae to hatch and they eat the inside of the plant the inflamed plant tissue um, from the hormones that the that the mother provides um these these are actually like here you can see the ridge where it is absolutely firmly on the branch. And these spikes are the spikes as with the pine tree. So they come straight through. Is that reasonable? I've probably got about eight on the tree, I should think, eight or 10 maybe. So you're saying just then they're not like baby pine cones then? I should just take them off. Uh, I wouldn't take them off. It's just part of. Uh, I I'll try to look into it during the week and and I'll take a screenshot of this and uh, see what I can come up with. But 
it's it's part of a That's native so plant. And, it's and so it's weird it. the way this ridge is exactly where you see the branch comes in, and these spikes have come straight through it. It's very strange. I mean, they belong to the tree. Oh, well. So I shouldn't take them off, you don't think. Not yet, anyway. Um, after, the, after the meeting, if, um, we could possibly forward your original email to Brendan so he could have a look at those pictures. Let's go to the next question. Thank you. Jack. Jack had something to say about Bartlett and Bosque pear trees. Go ahead, Jack. Uh, this, uh, you know, I forget, you know, two weeks ago, it wasn't Steve that was asking, you know, about the pear trees. I just wanted to show a picture of the the Bosque on the on the right and the Bartlett on the left. Uh, the Bosque is you know probably about thirty five years old and it kind of you know its production rate is definitely on the decline. Very nice looking. Okay, and I want to hear about your blueberry bushes. What's going on here? Wow. Yeah, so I got to have uh, Steve to thank for this project last week. After seeing him, it was really the grass was, you know, it was mostly weeds and whatnot, kind of overgrown. I sent my mower as low as it could go, just ran it back and forth, all different directions. And then I brought in uh, composted wood chips from a lot of tree work I had about five years ago and laid it all out. And in the process of that, I brought uh, grubs in the wood chips. So if anyone knows that, grubs, speak up. Any word on grubs? Hmm. So that's your blueberry area. That's pretty big. I'm impressed. And you 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 help that whole area with acid and do other things for blueberries in that. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed what you said. You you add like acid to the soil here, and it looks like you have netting around them. The whole thing. Yeah, you know, and that was something I said a couple of weeks ago about. Uh, you know, I really don't like bird netting. And then I realized that the netting I put over that you know, hoop set system is bird netting, but it's, uh, you know, it's more of a rigid, it's not, you know, the bird netting that, you know, comes in like an eight by 12 package and you open it up and it's just a, you know, a giant mess. This stuff is pretty, you know, rigid and it's about uh, seven foot high panels and I uh, zip tied them all together to cover that uh, blueberry patch. And that's about 20 by, 32 feet. Nice. If you need help picking blueberries, I know someone who loves doing that. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Joe is not here from a couple weeks ago. But Garrett, Garrett had a question related to this. This is his tomatillo plants, and he said he was seeing spots. Is that anything like what you looks like, Garrett? Uh, this looks more like a um, an insect. Mine look more like pinholes. I'm not sure if it's an insect or if it's from water damage. Did I, anybody did anybody catch that or no? You know, the problem with tomatoes. There's a lot of different fungal diseases, and it seems like it could be either one. Watering overhead, when you water on a sunny day, you get those little brown spots like that. I would look and see, for example, the new leaves don't seem to have a problem. So, if, you know, after, and they grow pretty quickly. So after a week, if your new leaves don't have those spots on them, I think you're safe. But if those spots continue to grow, 
it looks like trouble to me. And to, to determine the exact disease, you need to find, you know, more of a disease expert than I certainly am. But I would destroy those leaves and it continues to destroy the plant. I haven't heard about any any um, blight yet this year. I haven't heard of it either, and it is a little early in the season for it. But get trimming the bottoms of your tomato plants. Are they like close to the ground, or you have them trimmed like a good foot up? Um, they're not a foot up, but I have been picking the leaves off the bottom. Um, so I'll I'll go and do that again and yeah. start and start getting getting in there a little bit more. Um, the one that you have is, is a lot taller than the, or the one you gave me is a lot taller than the ones that I have in the ground. So I was a little hesitant to start pruning the bottoms of them until I got them a little taller. But I, I, I what I did do is I put my drip system around the base of the tomato plants Good. and I'm, I'm watering overhead with them. Yeah, watering overhead is always bad. And it's just, I'm just asking for that air circulation. You know, you want to keep that air underneath able to flow because if not, that I would say it would definitely be fungal. But are they aphids? Have you seen any aphids around? I haven't yet. So, because you know, sometimes they start attacking just really small too, right? Yeah. And then they'll lace up your leaves in no time. But I actually just ordered some ladybugs today to try to combat because I pulled some weeds out yesterday. Um, and I pulled a big weed out and it was completely covered in aphids. Yeah, it's it. Well, let me just add my, I have a, my cherry tree was all, all the leaves were curling up and I had aphids everywhere and I was getting ready to panic. And then I saw one ladybug and I was like, I'm going to trust. It was very hard not to go in and start spraying and knock on wood. Next thing I know, I saw a bunch of ladybugs and they, Really did a great, a, a great job. They chewed those, they chomped those aphids down. It was sure. buff, all you can eat buffet. You, so, know, so um, you gotta trust. You guys put neem oil on them, but I also, I put straw around the bottom of my tomato plants because when you get a heavy rain and that backsplash, that does also is not good for the plants. That can bring, tomatoes are very fussy for the, giant size they are, I must say. But yeah, I would get get a bale of straw and put that around the bottom of your tomato plants also. All right, even with the drip system, you don't think it's gonna... No, I do have you have, a, I, I have, do you have a, mulch? I have a deep straw mulch bedding and I have my drip irrigation underneath it. Okay. So, and it's fine, it does. And I mean, the, the backsplash is the problem. I do the same thing, Sarah, I'm like right there with you. That's why I was asking about the trimming. You know, the higher right. you come up, the less backsplash, the less you'll possibly transfer that fungal up. Right, the issue is that the drip system gives a proper watering, but if you get these big downpours in the summer, that's where you can get the backsplash. So the straw helps, plus it helps keep the moisture in. Right, right, right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go do that right yeah, now. Do, do you have any mulch? Do you have any mulch at all, Garrett? Or no? Yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> I have a bunch of, um, a bunch of uh, maple mulch, maple chips and stuff. And I have, and I have, uh, I have straw. Oh, so you have some? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just maybe, you know, maybe a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. Just keep an eye on it, because a lot of times. I find if you watch something for a little while, you'll come to the determination about, you know, do you need to pull it or is it just an, you know, an environmental issue for a little few minutes? Right, right, right. Yay, broccoli. Thank you. I moved his head to the next question from Nicole. Yeah, I don't know if it's powdery mildew or what it is, and I've harvested from this broccoli a couple of times now. This is, I have four plants, and it's happening to only a couple of them. Um, and I don't, again, I don't know if it's powdery mildew or what it is. I've never had to figure it out. So what's happening to my broccoli? Hmm. Hmm. Usually my problem with, with uh, any type of brasilicas is flea beetles, and those little cabbage moths, but this is like a brown and pa papery kind of burnt edges, it looks like. 
Yeah, just on the edges. And then, like, I, I should have took a better picture of the plant overall. It's fine on most of the pieces. It's just these bottom ones. And two of them were bad a couple of days ago when I pulled those. Because as soon as I see something like this, I want to try to stop it, of course, right? But it kept going. So, and I don't, has anybody suffered any powdery mildew with any, um, like vining things before? Cause I know it can be fairly common with like zucchini and stuff and eggplant. Yeah, but I didn't know it early for mildew too. Yes, I'm saying it seems very early for that though. Yeah, that usually comes when we really get into the, the humidity. Well, yeah, tell my broccoli plants that. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe. Maybe Nicole, because you know you again you have you know you these, you probably had these things going uh, for a while, right? Because you started everything pretty early. Not the broccoli. This stuff I uh, started actually a little late. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, it does seem very early for um, mildewy stuff, but it doesn't appear to be that. I don't know. Uh, are they getting too much sun? Are they getting like a lot of? They're in pretty much full sun all day. Could that be a bit much, Sarah? For like you know broccoli to be. Uh, I mean, I always find that any of, any of these cabbage type plants, the bottom leaves just tend to, you know, get damaged after a while. And I'm, the garden we have, it's not like we're looking at it every day. So the, the watering is not totally consistent. We keep up with it, but it's not a situation where you're out there really babying them. Once they get started, uh, we look at them a couple times a week. So. There's usually a, the bottom leaves, uh, I go and just trim them off and pitch them. All right, that makes sense. Thank you guys. Pants don't look that old. Um, I remember Bill talking about he was sprouting some things and maybe we can ask him to do a, a session on sprouting soon, but Bill, are you sprouting some things now that you'll be putting in later? Well, and what do you in general, what, you, what is the easiest thing to sprout? What are you talking about sprouting? You're talking about sprouts to put in salad, or are you talking about the seeds? Seeds. Seeds. Okay. Yeah. 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 okay. <laughs> I thought you were talking about something else. Um, I did too. Well, you should you should put seeds in depending on what you want to grow. And uh, right now, if you're thinking about fall planting, you should be planting uh, whatever you're going to want for the fall. So, you know, brassicas of all types, uh, probably some new broccoli, um, cabbage, um, uh, cauliflower, stuff like that. Uh, I, I sprout, not to, so sprout, I seed lettuce every couple of weeks because I want to keep it going all summer. So I, I put new lettuce in uh, every few weeks. And I really, I always start things in, inside now because the weather dries out things so quickly, seeds find it pretty hard to grow and to survive when they're really little. So I'm almost always planting inside, getting them to a certain size, only a couple inches, and then putting them out. Uh, I find it works better for me to do that. So... Um, Fill directly out or you have to harden them off right now? Uh, you wouldn't have to harden them off uh, much. Uh, I wouldn't put them directly out. Uh, they should be getting enough light and they should be outside maybe only a day or two uh, just to get them accustomed to being out. Uh, they don't have to be hardened off for a week or anything like that now. Uh, but when you put them out, you might want to cover them with shade netting for a day or two because the transition is hard and keep them watered for a week or so. And uh, protect them from the insects because nothing looks better to an insect than a nice, small, juicy plant in the summer. Mm. So. Yes, yum. Okay, thank you, Bill. Any other comments on that? Uh, I'll say, and Michael, this pertains to us as well. Um, one of the seed people that I follow had mentioned today that it would, like right now is kind of the last week to plant some beans and some peas going for the season, so. If anybody's looking to get that stuff in, this might be the last time to kind of direct so beans. That. And no, no, be hold on. Beans or peas? She had said for bush beans and for pole beans. Why do you disagree with that? No, I disagree. I beans grow very quickly. You can you can plant beans around here every two or three weeks apart 
way into July. Yeah, I think so too. That, yeah. I do that. I, and I, I also plant pole beans fairly late because they grow so yeah. fast. Yeah. Uh, but peas right now, if we're going to hit July and August, peas are yeah. not going to do well. No, peas, definitely not peas. But beans, just, so, you know, they, they, um, they fruit themselves out after you get a heavy harvest for a few weeks and then it gets to be kind of um, thin. So that's why I always put in succession plants. Okay, very good. Now, Gail asked the question uh, by phone this week, by, by email this week, not by phone. Gail asked a question by um, email about maybe at the end of the year we could talk about well, what are good varieties that really work for people so that when you when you get to January and everything was great in the catalog, everyone would know. But I think strawberries, now we have some strawberries that are coming ripe and we're gonna have to thin our strawberry um, patch. And we're thinking about starting a second one, but we're also sort of looking for a second variety of strawberries. Um, um, so can anyone recommend a good variety of strawberries? And is there other things that really people should be looking for now that they can recommend good varieties for? I, I can't answer that question, but I have another question about strawberries. Um, when I was at Midsummer Farm a couple of years ago, I asked for four strawberry plants and I got three, I'm not sure what variety, but regular strawberry plants. And then one looked different, but Barbara gave it to me. So I took it home and it's an alpine strawberry and it's huge. And I've, has anybody ever had alpine strawberries? Um, I have it, one of those plants. Wild, but I haven't eaten anything yet. I have one of those, but I grow it in a container. And I think I'm growing it for the birds. I mean, they're, they're cute. They're minor little, like a thumbnail size. But it's not really grown out in the ground in optimal conditions. It's in a, a flower container. But they taste okay. Oh yeah, no, they're they're real strawberries. Nothing bad will happen. We have one too, and uh, and they're great. But uh, also a container on the back porch. Right. Yeah, in a strawberry container. We just I just bought strawberries this year from Heaven Hill Farm. They're the everlasting strawberries. They're supposed to bloom a lot in June now. I have at least a hundred out here. They're in a rain gutter on my back porch. Um, my son got very excited before and pulled them just as they're starting to blush. And I'll say this, I ate one that was less blushing and red than this one, and it was super sweet. And, and like soft, even at this point, surprisingly so, because usually whenever you get a strawberry that's not ripe from the store, it's just terrible, mm -hmm. right? Bitter. But these were really good, so they're. I think they're ever bearing is the variety from Heaven Hill Farm. Mm -hmm. I got six of them. I believe it was like five dollars for six plants, six starts. And I now anybody, like. Don't I want to start like start uh, once? Don't I want to start strawberries like now for next year, or, or I mean, in a few weeks for next year? I th I think you have to plant them soon if you want to get things next year. Uh, if you wait till the fall, <clears throat> it's going to be too late. They, they they'll be alive next year, but they won't produce next year very very well. Okay. And uh, someone in the chat mentioned, uh, Sylvia said, uh, a day natural, ever bearing and June bearing. So uh, that's on the chat from uh, Sylvia, some good advice on strawberries. Does anybody know how to cut like those umbilical cord pieces and then make that to propagate it to make it a new plant? Because that's what strawberries do, right? They send out those long shoots and then they yep. start growing again and they'll root. Is anybody familiar with that process? Uh, yeah, all you have to do is let them uh, put their roots in the ground and develop some roots and then just uh, just cut them off from the mother plant and plant them. And that's your yeah. work. I've yeah. been doing yeah. that for a long yeah. time. Yeah. It's very, yeah, very simple. Right. Okay, so they just have to establish wherever they're going right. to land now. 
Yeah, right. they need to have some soil or something where they can develop right. the roots, and then you can just cut them off when they look at a reasonable size. Uh, don't cut them off when they're really, really tiny because the roots haven't developed yet. Okay. okay. Like a spider plant. Do you grow spider plants? Never have. Okay. But isn't it also that you pretty much need to thin your strawberries too, right? So it's, that should like be like a natural function that uh, the strawberry plants are like, you know, a little bit too dense in an area, and then you want to uh, thin them out. Patch, which you you could be, uh, you know, uh, trading with neighbors so you get different varieties. The bearer of fruit, quite literally. <laughs> Very nice. So I've been um, obtaining a journal. Um, I have a strawberry bush go growing and it's thriving amazingly. Um, so I le learned a little trick of the trays. They tend to want to fall to the ground because they're, they, they grow that little bunch. If you take a fork and put the, the fork end goes up and you take it and you put the stick on the bottom, you can hang your strawberries to keep them off the soil. Um, they don't, um, they do well, they don't do well above 85 degree temperature. So definitely once this is getting harder, hotter, cloth shade the area. Um, and the three varieties will give you a long season. Um, harvest often um those runners they do drain your plant for for, heart, for growth so they say cut them as soon as you see them identify them just cut them off and replant them quickly because they just suck the nutrients out of your strawberries and i've been um fertilizing with um esposma it's a um, holly tone mm -hmm. uh, weekly or maybe every other week. And it's just beautiful. It's green, it's fruitful. It's been a positive experience. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. That's awesome. That Ford thing is genius. I'm so excited. You just yeah. saw major issues with netting <laughs> you over here. They say you don't want the foliage to touch the soil because you open yourself for disease. Yeah. So, so, so literally, I took a fork and then and they're like four of them and they're holding up my strawberries there you go stick a fork in it <laughs> okay actually steve isn't here tonight um bill did, we didn't ask you in advance if you wanted to do a weekly update but off the top of your head can you tell us what you're doing this week and garrett do you want to tell us what you're doing or, or if you prefer not that's yeah, okay. sure i can i can you didn't ask anyone to prepare so we really get any update uh, what I've been doing mostly is just finishing up mulching the walkways and mulching the beds because uh, it's been rather dry and sunny. So I wanted to make sure that everything was mulched. So I've done a lot of that. Uh, I've been looking for a lot of insects this week to come out. I've seen uh, potato beetles, cucumber beetles, uh, and I've been trying to get those early, the first ones, so that they don't develop into hordes. Um, and I've been watering some because again, it's not, it's not, it's been pretty dry and sunny. In fact, I can't remember that we've had so many sunny days in a row compared to, uh, you know, to what we're having now. It's really a lot of sun. Uh, so anyway, that's, those are the three things I've been doing this week. Um, and I'm also starting seeds for the fall, uh, the brassicas mostly. Hmm. And, and, sorry, when do you put those in the, uh... When do you put those in? Does, oh, okay. Does, well, I, I start the seeds now, and I put them in the last two weeks in July. Uh, I try to get plants that are going to be about six inches by then. Uh, I don't want to put something out that's too small. And, uh, and I protect them. I usually put some netting over them because uh, nice brassicas in July, uh, you get a lot of bugs like, liking them. So you have to protect them. And... Uh, you know, take good care of them, and you'll get your, your brassicas in, you know, the end of September, October, uh, pretty much. Thank you. Uh, that's about it that I've been doing. G Garrett, do you want to share anything, or should I pause recording, or you rather, we didn't give you No, any no, I'm fine, I'm fine. Uh, so remember I took the, the 
I, I was really interested in growing my peppers in a pot and I put the compost and the, and the manure at the base of the pot and then I put the, the potting soil on top. Well, those yeah. peppers are taken off. They're just, they're happy as happy could be. So that was a, a good little trick. And then uh, what do we have? We have, um, we did uh, pole beans are in the ground, cucumbers are in the ground. Um, we, uh, I, I've been buying basil because you can never have enough basil. We're drying out some of the herbs that have grown. Um, and uh, yeah, tomatoes are in because we, we talked about tomatoes earlier. Um, harvesting radishes and, uh, and lettuces now. Um, the, my beets are going which are really I'm happy with as well as the carrots are going, which I'm happy with. And it's been so far the lovage plant, whoever brought that up, our lovage plant is like out of control, just out of control. So uh, we have, we have a, a whole, a whole pole system and it's just growing up and we're protecting that too. So uh, tr uh, um, the, the, I have pods on the peas, but the peas aren't uh, no, no peas in the pods. Yeah, I'm wondering about that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Now we're doing a shorter session, but do you want to get still do your little sachet? <laughs> um, let's see. You know, um, Nicole's son was going to lead us in that, but maybe we'll wait till nine o'clock for that. Um, let's see. Um, announcements. So the community garden is all planted. You want to say anything about that, Sarah? Unmute. We're going off to a, a very slow start this year because of the, the COVID virus. We weren't really able to have large groups of people in there working. But since the end of May, we did have some spinach and greens that we were able to put in in March, and we've been harvesting those. And it's been a marathon of planting cucumbers, squash, tomatoes, beans. We're devoting a larger portion of the harvest to the food pantry this year. So usually I look for unique varieties, which we're still doing, but I'm planting a lot of real basic, you know, cukes, peppers, tomatoes, beans. And then um, some of the more, you know, fun things for the, for the members, because we have quite a few members. The, the beets are up. So it, I plant, continue planting pretty much all through July, some of the things, you know, to keep them going, the beans. So it's good. It's all good. Great. That's awesome. And if you want, I, I would love to share some seeds with you. If you want to check them out, if I have any varieties that you guys would like for the garden, I'd love to put some in. Oh, thank you. Um, so a uh, some of the members of Sustainable Warwick have been putting together this really cool water, Warwick Food Shed Locavores map, uh, where you can find if something has been grown locally, it's for sale locally, you can go on the map and find it. It will be going, oh, Chad, Chad could be telling about this. Chad has been involved. Go ahead, Chad. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm it's okay. Yeah, so we're uh, kind of partnered up, Grolo, who've been with with you guys, and um, Orion, I was hoping he'd join us tonight. He's really a key member, and he's incredibly knowledgeable about uh, local food and you know uh, right once this coronavirus happened we really uh we decided that we really wanted to find a way to help people find local food sources within 25 miles of warwick and uh we found out the term is local vor as you know ryan has a whole bunch of uh terminologies so and you know it's uh hopefully by june 20th we're going to uh Really, you know, launch this on the Sustainable Warwick website, and it's hopefully it's going to be something you could add to. But you could look up uh, stuff, and it has you know whether they they have eggs or dairy or vegetables or CSAs or farmers markets hours. You could click it, and it'll take you to an interactive map. You know, show you right where to go, phone numbers, all contact information. So you know, it's really coming along very nicely, and we're hoping that you guys will add. You know, because there's plenty of stuff roadsides stands that we don't even know about you know we're hoping to get a really comprehensive map to to really connect the uh, producers and the consumers directly so uh, we're very excited about that and please hopefully check it out in the 20th and uh it should be a really really good uh, asset and spread the word and we'll 
we'll we'll use we'll 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 also when it goes live we'll also email a link to everybody on our our list. Chad, have you had that meeting tomorrow night? Yes, and I have a Grow Local Greenwood Lake meeting uh, tomorrow night at eight. You're also on Zoom, thanks to Michael and Sustainable Warwick. Uh, you know, we're just going to go over all the stuff that we are working on in Greenwood Lake. So if anyone's interested, please come join us. We can, the more the merrier. Thank you. And I, and I want to clarify, <laughs> sorry, you don't have to live in Greenwood Lake to participate right. in that. Especially right. living in the lake is so hard. You know, it's so wet all the time. So you, you don't have to go that far into it. Yeah. <laughs> And um, so Sustainable Warwick meets on Wednesday uh, at 7.30. And, you know, we do a lot of stuff besides gardening, but we appreciate everyone who participates. So at this point, we're going to, um, oh, I have some trellises that Nicole shared, but that's not Brendan Wagner's. So it's Brendan's turn to talk about trellises. Brendan, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? We, yes, we, we could. could. And I think there's something... I'm going to stop sharing, and there may be something I can do so that you can come. What was that? I, I'm go go ahead, go ahead. Let's see. Okay, so I uh, I think I saw my neighbor on here earlier, so I want to give her a shout out. Um, I moved to Warwick uh, four years ago. I live on the Bolenbach farm that uh, me and my wife rent out here. And uh, I'm an ecologist by trade. I do river restoration and management projects for the New York City watershed up on the Rondout Creek and Never Sink River headwaters. And when I moved here, this is the first place that I've lived um, in, one, in one place for more than eight months since uh, about a decade ago when I was 18 in my parents' house. So. When I moved here, I wanted to start gardening. So I asked the landlord for permission and I turned a little corner over there into a small garden and then grew and grew and grew from there. I discovered permaculture and that kind of changed my world and changed the way I work professionally and, and changed the way I run my life. So um, the first garden that I have is my herb garden, of course, right outside the kitchen here. This is a hygge culture uh, herb spiral garden. That's looking pretty good right now. No trellising needed for that. Um, this is a little uh, three sisters garden, actually. There's corn, beans, and squash growing here. It's a little bit of this weak deer netting as a trellis for some extra beans. Take some pressure off the corn. And uh, on the left, I have what I call my regenerative ag garden. And on the right here is kind of my permaculture playground garden. Um, this is what I built this year. Everything that you see was built on top of either thistle or uh, turf grass. So every bit is uh, sheet mulched with cardboard and all the free wood chips that we get from all of our great arborists around the area. So this is a, um, this is a beginning elderberry uh, nursery that's uh, made from cuttings, dormant cuttings. This is an expanding uh, apple orchard nursery that I'm using. I'm growing a lot of uh, a lot of my perennials and fruit trees and nuts are in pots over there. You'll see because we're renting here. We're hoping to buy a place next year to turn into a kind of regenerative permaculture educational community farm. Um, this is a sunchoke bed. This is a little keyhole bed of uh, all sorts of mixed tomatoes gourds, sunflowers, strawberries. This is a hugo culture bed. And then here's another trellis that I just installed right before this call started. And this is kind of like the two inch by four inch um, plastic coated metal wire fencing that I've got propped up on T-posts. T-posts are my favorite thing because they're so cheap and uh, I'm renting, it's easy to take them out and put them in seasonally and take them with me when I move. So this is a mixed hugo culture of tomatillo, sunflower, watermelons, tomatoes, chard, gourds. Um, there's a strawberry bed over there, just kind of mixed herbs growing all over.
And this is the main garden. So my tool shed. This is strawberries. These are spring greens. Just planted uh, another three sisters, corn, beans, squash here. This is a potato bed. And then here's where I really start with my trellis systems. And um, this is kind of modified from some things that I saw online. This is a T post with quarter inch PVC plumbing pieces. And then the top rail is made out of half inch rebar, 10 foot sections. And then where they join, I, uh, I kind of wrap them for some bracing with some half inch interior diameter PVC piping. And then everything is often held together by these um, kind of laundry line uh, material. It's kind of uh, plastic wrap metal wire. And this is, this is Reggie, he's the chipmunk guardian of the garden. So this is a pea trellis that's growing up in between brassicas and the peas are liking this really well. This comes in 20, 20, 25 feet, get it online. I think five inch spacing in the webbing. And this is a pepper trellis. Uh, last year, my peppers grew so big that they're all folding over and, and hitting on the ground. So this is my first year trellising peppers. Um, this is that same material, that kind of clothesline. Um, these are plastic insulators that are made to work with the TPO system. And all three of these I get at Tractor Supply. So the peppers have something to stand on. So this is an interplanted. I have carrots on the right, peppers in the center, and onions on the left going through this whole bed. And then here, like Nicole had, these are the best. Um, these are called cattle panels or hog panels, depending on the size. You get these from tractor supply as well. And they're pretty cheap. They're only like $20, $25. The real pain is finding someone with a pickup truck to drive them to your house because it's really the only way that I found is to kind of roll them in a circle and put them in the bed of a pickup truck. And that's, of course, for the cucumbers, which are kind of just getting started here and I like to put some sunflowers on the corners because they get so big here that they need a little help. Um, these two rows are mixed beds. I've got potatoes, uh, squash, cucumbers. I'll put um, eggplant in here tomorrow. I've got some sweet potato vines growing and this one I'll probably put up this trellis along with these cucumbers. Here's some a little bit older cucumbers and even some zucchini summer squash that I'm putting up on this trellis. Um, this, is a, um, this is a cold frame that I built from down trees uh, that were taken uh, when the properties around here started getting developed. And I put in a natural adobe filler in those and some window frames that I found uh, on the village of Florida's uh, garbage clean out day. So this becomes a cold frame in the spring. And all on the back of it, I have planted, uh, these are willow, dormant willow stakes that I put in as a kind of a structural as the cold frame was setting. And now the willow have grown up and they've become a trellis for my peas, kind of a living trellis through here that all my peas are growing in. And it also acts as a bit of a shade for my greens bed over here. This is my lettuce, uh, bok choy, napa cabbage, um, kohlrabi, things that don't like the heat so much. I'm hoping that they'll get a little shade coming off of that living trellis. And then finally, I have, well, this is a, um, this is a cider apple orchard where I have rootstock for cloning each year and also uh, baby cider apples in pots for when we get our farm. 
And then this is the best one. This is my favorite is the tomato trellis. I've always had such problems with my tomatoes. Uh, they get so big and unruly and I, I get so excited about planting them. I have 17 varieties, um, you know, 30 plus plants in this bed, I think. And, uh, you know, they, once they take off, they really take off. So this year I've been really good about pruning all of my suckers and I'm using the little plastic tomato clips you can get online with nylon string from Wadesons. And, um, you know, as long as you prune off those suckers and grow them as a vine instead of a bush, I'm um, hoping that they'll grow nicely and cleanly up these lines. Um, these are some seven foot T posts, I think is the largest you can get from Tractor Supply without a custom order. And then down here, I have some 10 foot T posts that are really nice. And so here I have my a lot of my cherry varieties and things that I'm expecting to grow very tall, very high out here. So I kind of made these trellis designs up because uh, figuring out what works with what I can get locally and trying to copy some of the professional farmers as best I could um, for my scale. And uh, I'm pretty excited about it. I think I'm finally going to have my plants off the ground where I can you know, get my squash bugs off the bottom of my leaves and keep my tomatoes from rotting before I can can them. Um, but yeah, that's it. Um, if anyone has any questions. Uh, where do you house your workers? <laughs> <laughs> uh, right there. <laughs> you, you do this entire garden? You're doing this yourself? Yep. Wow. My, is kind of the cook she doesn't really like to garden too much so this is uh wow and plus you work crazy hours right yeah well luckily i would not have done the uh the expansion garden of that permaculture area this year um over here if it weren't for covid i was supposed to be in ireland this spring with uh, my family so this was definitely uh only because became of that but um yeah, in the spring I have some time, and then in the summer uh, I'm busy working 50 hours a week, uh, uh, overseeing the construction of uh, stream restoration projects for New York City watershed. Well, that's so, very beautiful. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah, so something that I um, we were talking about the last meeting I was on was what to do with all this extra food, and uh, well, first I need my neighbor to come over and help me eat some of it, but. Um, I've been thinking about, you know, it was a great idea that was brought up of putting out a donation-based farm stand um, where I can uh, take those donations and, and put them, instead of donating my extra food, just donate the money and resources to local groups. So I think that's one of the next projects is trying to build a little farm stand out here. And then we could put you on the locavores map. That's right. <laughs> right, Orion? Well, it was very, very nice. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. I'd be really interested in seeing one of those beds much later in the season that had like the tomatoes and the watermelon and the strawberries and like all the stuff you were mentioning. I would love to see that like thriving. Yeah, yeah you're pretty intense. You, you have really stuff really close together and like uh, it's interesting the combination. So I'd be interested as well. But Brendan, I notice sometimes there seems to be um, a, a noise come from your phone, so I sometimes put you on mute, but always feel free to unmute yourself. But it oh, seems okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, I was just saying, um, you know, this garden over here is, uh, I do a lot of soil testing. Um, I work with some agronomists in my work and do a lot of um, studying of soil science and agronomy and uh, soil biology. So this side gets a lot of um, amendments and uh, compost teas and and all that and then this side is kind of my experimental side where I'm just kind of trying to do less work and kind of more permaculture and see what happens so um, I'm giving with the trellising I'm hoping I give it a lot more room to grow out either side of this uh, Hugo culture. Oh it looks great thank you. Brendan looks gorgeous. That's great.
really what good. are you using for amendments um i only amend based on a soil test so uh i use logan labs it's only 25 dollars to get their standard soil test um main amendments i like to use is uh organic soybean meal or alfalfa meal for nitrogen um like rock phosphate uh, langbenite for uh potassium um but it, it's you know it's specifically what my beds need um you know you never put anything on without a test hmm. And and you what do you test you test for what just to get the basic makeup of the soil you're not testing for like uh, lead or any or metals or are you or are you just testing the makeup of the soil? Uh, yeah, so the uh, major and minor soil nutrients. Um, mm. you know, it starts with pH, uh, organic matter, um, NPK, um, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and then uh, some of the minor micronutrients: iron, magnesium boron, sulfur, uh, copper, I'm probably forgetting a couple. Yeah. Oh, it's getting a little dark here. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, it's almost nine, it's almost nine o'clock. Look how that, look how it's happening. <laughs> I've got some, some pretty big peppers coming in already. How's the credit situation by you? Uh, I, I, uh, rats are probably my biggest problem in this garden, actually. I, I use a seven foot, just really light deer fence. And the, the deer don't really bother me until the rut, until mating season. And then they start, they'll just knock this thing right down. But by that time, pretty much everything is harvested out of here. Sorry, someone asked uh, on the chat if he, about using, do you use manure? Uh, I don't use any manure. I work with um, a lot of regional compost facilities and I'll use um, that. Like the most local one is uh, organic uh, ORI in Goshen. Um, there's Aiden, Aiden Brook up in Montgomery and um, Ulster County Resource Recovery Agency. But I don't ha really have a source of manures. Um, I'm a little cautious about the uh, horse manures because of dewormers. And uh, yeah, I, I build a lot of my own compost as well. Like all the t compost I use for extracts and teas come from my you know custom homemade compost. Um, yeah, so veganically, yeah, I try to do mostly veganics. Um, I don't use any bone meal or blood meal or anything from factory cattle farming or anything like that. I like that term, veganically. I'm gonna write that one down. This is Melanie, I was the one who asked. I, it's, it's, um, hmm, it's rare to find somebody who's doing that and having such, uh, Beautiful results, and it would be nice to quote your work to others. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I professionally I work for the Sullivan County Soil and Water Conservation District, and then um, in my personal kind of outlet, I call Thriving Ecology, and that is uh, I'm just getting it started. Actually, just started. Um, at the beginning of COVID, where I developed a, a garden guide for people to turn lawns into gardens based on the techniques that I've developed. And um, I'm, I'm looking to start doing uh, site consultations, um, donation based, where I'm hoping to, you know, work with landowners to either design gardens or help them garden better, uh, make soil tests, interpret soil tests, and then, um, not looking for money myself. I'm not set up as a business. I'd rather uh, me and the, the landowner kind of find a, a worthy cause that they can donate to instead because I've been kind of having a hard time finding local organizations to donate my time to to help with this kind of thing. So um, I'd really and then you know my current um, interest is helping you know uh, BIPOC black indigenous people of color 
and land access, um, returning them to to the land and um, getting you know helping them develop farms and farm systems. Um, so if anyone out there is interested in something like that, I'd be you know I'd be happy to come over and spend an hour or two working with you and, and helping you get set up like this. Oh, thank you. That's great. That's beautiful, Brendan. Um, my name is Melanie. I'm I mostly do activist work, and I have a teeny tiny little postage stamp lawn that I would love some help with. So I would love to get in touch with you. Um, so if you can maybe leave contact information, that would be great. So I'm Brendan's neighbor, right across the street. And I have to tell you, um, the other day I, I would see him slaving over this garden. Like my daughter would say, Brendan's still outside. Brendan's still outside. He's the reason why I'm, he's the reason he was so inspiring and allowed me to come to um, see his garden and, and was so graciously warm and welcoming to um, talk about himself and his garden that inspired me to start my first, very first garden. Yay, that's awesome. Yeah. Still, <laughs> but still, but still, that's funny because you, remember you said at that last meeting, you said, that's my neighbor. And I said, is that Brendan? I, I had a feeling, is that funny? No, I it didn't, I didn't put two and two together. I know, I was like, I was like, I just had a feeling. I'm like, is it a guy named Brendan? And you're like, I don't know. <laughs> that's funny. Oh, it comes full circle. Yes, small world. Folks, we, we're at nine o'clock now. Um, I have a few images from Nicole from her trellises, but I'm gonna move that we put those up next week. We'll save them for session eight, which will be two weeks from tonight on June 29th. Does anyone else have any closing marks they would care to share? No, and uh, just, yeah, Brendan, I, I'll give, you know, if you want me to give out your, uh, contact info, you know, just let me know and I could, you know, Melanie or anyone else could share that, okay? Yeah, um, if anyone wants to know it, well, uh, Instagram and Facebook, Thriving Ecology, as well as Thriving Ecology at gmail.com. So you can reach me through any. Thriving Ecology at Gmail, sending you an email right now, Brendan, thank you. All right, I'm glad. I propose Brendan does another tour towards the end of the season. I'd like to do that again, please. Yeah. Maybe we'll all go in person one day, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That would that would be ideal. Yeah, that'd be great. Well, thank you everyone. Thanks again for a great session. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Good night. Okay, stay safe out there. Good night, everybody. Thank you for doing these, Michael. Oh, happy to do.